So, Colossians. Um, the verse we're going to memorize this month is Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. And I don't have the projector. Well, the projector's there, but I don't have the computer all set up today. Um, so there's going to be some difference depending on what translation you're reading from. Um, I've got the new King James here that I always use. But let me read it to you once, and then we'll um, talk about it just for a minute, and then read it together. So Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 says, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, or insight, some versions say. Um, and this is a prayer that goes on for, you got verse 9, 10, 11, uh, 12. So it's a long prayer, actually. And what I've encouraged you in the past to do is to take some prayers from the Bible and pray them for somebody. Pray them for one another, for your spouse, for your pastor, um, for your children. Um, so I think this is one of those, one such prayer that's worthwhile praying. And not just, not just by rote, not just a memorized prayer, but pray it, you know, sincerely, meaning what it says. So let's read this together. Uh, Colossians 1, yeah. verse 9. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Colossians 1, 9. Now, let me explain a little bit what we're going to do here. This is going to, Colossians is packed full. I mean, it's really packed full of of teaching, of doctrine. So I don't know if we'll even get done, I don't know, when it'll be. A year from this Christmas? I don't know. Now, one of the things I do ask on, on here, one of the things we have to do is ask questions. Who, what are the other questions we can ask? Who, what, when, where, why, how come? And sometimes we say, um, what, um, not just what's happening, but what can I learn from this? What does this mean to me? What can I share with somebody else? Uh, what's the impact on a church? What, a lot, there's a lot of what questions. And so sometimes people ask me how, how, you, how I teach, whatever. How do I get the stuff out of here? That's what I do. I ask myself lots and lots of questions. Okay? So I'm going to read Colossians 1, 1 through 8. And if we get through verse 1 today, we'll be a blessed people. Okay? Um, so Colossians 1, 1 through 8. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timothy our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is faithful ministry of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the spirit. Okay, just look at those verses for a minute, and let's ask some questions. Um, what would be some obvious questions that pop into your mind out of any of those verses that we read, or even the first two or three? Who is it written to? Who is it written to? Okay. What else? Who's writing it? Who's writing? What's it trying to bring across? What's it trying to bring across? What's the point? Mm hmm any other things? Where are the persons at that they're writing to? Where are they at that they're writing to? Is there any other where questions? Where are the people at that he's writing to? Is there any other where question? Where is Paul? Where is Paul? All right. Anybody know the answer to that question? Where is Paul? Hmm? If you had to guess some place that Paul's been, where, what? Prison. Prison, yes, exactly. Uh, there's another where question then. In prison, where? where? What are some guesses? Rome. Rome? 
That would be right. He's in Rome. Yep. Yeah. Um, so what else? What other questions could we ask? What was it? Tim? What? Why? Why are you? Yeah. Why is he writing this? Why is he writing it? Yeah. And we'll, we'll t as we talk, as we get going on it, uh, Paul, as far as we know, was never in Colossae. Um, Epaphras was. It looks like Epaphras maybe was the was the one who um, led the church there, or or started the church. Maybe we don't really know whether he started it or not, but he seems to be the one that was there. And um, there's another who question. Yeah, who for Epaphras? But you got other people mentioned here besides who it was written to, who it came from is Paul, obviously. Um, you see any other names there? Timothy, right? Timothy was there. And so Paul was in Rome. We figured that out. I told you that. Paul was in Rome and in prison. And so who was with him? Timothy. Picture that. Was Timothy a prisoner in Rome, to your knowledge? That'd be a question, wouldn't it? Was Timothy in prison? I don't think so. No, he wasn't. No, I don't know. He wasn't, but that would be a question, wouldn't it, to investigate? He, he wasn't in prison. So what does that tell you about Paul's imprisonment? He could He's have a, visitors. Hmm? He could have visitors. He could have visitors, exactly. And when he was a prisoner in Rome, prisoners in Rome didn't, weren't necessarily in a cell free to walk around. They were chained to a guard. So Paul likely was chained to a guard, and Timothy was there. And we find out when we get to verse 7, uh, or actually later it mentions Epaphras again. Epaphras is there, but Epaphras came from Colossae, so Epaphras probably talked to Paul about what was going on in Colossae, but that meant Paul was there with a guard, and Timothy, and Epaphras, and Epaphras is telling him what's going on in Colossae, so What's the guard hearing? He's hearing this whole discussion about what's going on in Colossae, what Paul's advice to Colossae. Paul says, I better write a letter. So he writes a letter and sends it off. So you have to, re you have to remember that, that you know, we, this is our Bible. This is inspired by God. But this is also the interaction of people under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, yes. But Paul's deciding to write a letter, but there's conversations. These are people. There's lo people are living lives. And the jail guards are coming in and bringing food and doing different things like that is happening in that prison. So it's not just, it's not just literature here for us, inspired literature, that we're going to gain some spiritual information from. It's also the living activity of actual people and what they were doing. And we don't know if anybody was led to the Lord by Paul in that prison at that time. But um, it certainly, Paul was not afraid to evangelize prison guards, right? You know that because what other prison? Hmm? The, the, the jailer, the, when, he, when Paul was in prison a different time in Philippi, then you have the Philippian jailer, right? All right, so verse 1, Paul, so he's announcing who he is. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. All right, so let me break up the room a little bit. If you feel like you're in the front half over here, look up Romans 1.1. 1, 1. If you feel like you're in the back half of that room, look up the side over here, look up 1 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. If you think you're in the front half over here, look up 1 Timothy 1.1. 1, 1. And if you're in the back half of this side over here, look up Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. Okay, so Romans 1 1, 1 Corinthians 1 1, 1 Timothy 1 1, and Ephesians 1 1. Look up one of those passages based on what I just said. <clears throat> All right, so somebody who's got Romans, what we're going to do is look for comparisons of what Paul says in that first verse, okay? So in this, in Colossians, he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Okay, so somebody with Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Read what it says. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. All right, so give it to me again. Paul, what? A servant of Jesus. So he's a servant. 
of Jesus Christ by the will of God, it said, right? Did it say called in yours? Does it say called in Romans 1 1? Does it say called in Romans 1 1? Okay. In, in Colossians, it didn't say called, right? Called. Yeah, right. 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 So Paul's an apostle. He's called, and it's by the will of God. And he, he's called a servant there, too, a servant of Jesus Christ. So in, in Colossians, he didn't say servant, but you've got the will of God so far. He's a servant. He's called. Okay, the back half over here. What did we have? Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. Somebody read that for me. Okay, so Sothenes was with him then, right? Um, read it one more time. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sothenes our brother. Okay, so he was called. That was mentioned again. And he's an apostle, and it's by the will of God. Okay, over here, um, 1 Timothy 1.1. 1, 1. Somebody? Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. So he's an apostle by the commandment of God, not just the will of God, but the commandment of God. So the will of God, the will of God that Paul that made Paul an apostle is not just a will like God's okay with it. Is it the will of God that I go on a trip next week? You, know, on a, you say, I'll go if it's the will of God. Well, you go, but it's not like God said you had to go on this trip, this vacation. But Paul's apostle by the will of God, meaning that's what God wanted. He's called of God to do this. Okay? Um, Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. Okay, so they're, yeah, they're quite similar, aren't they? All these places. It was interesting. Um, I was listening, I think it was John MacArthur on, on Colossians. And he says in Galatians, the whole thing about Galatians is Paul's trying to prove he's an apostle. So he doesn't start out with that. He's just got a couple of chapters that's just, that's the whole purpose, trying to convince him he's not a false prophet or false apostle. What is an, here's another what question. The third word in, the, in my version says Paul, an apostle. And we heard that in all these. What's the question? What, what is an apostle? An apostle is the one that's actually seen, had a personal relationship with Christ, where the disciple is just a follower of Christ. Mm -hmm. And where do you know that definition from? Because I'm smart. Okay. <laughs> an apostle is someone who has seen Christ? Right. So Paul actually saw Christ. On the, road to the, on the road to Damascus, at least. Mm -hmm. What did you say an apostle was? I'm listening to what he said. He said an apostle is somebody who's seen Christ and what else? Had, a, had an experience with Christ. Had an experience with Christ. Okay. In other words, like, like the, what we consider the 12 disciples, they were actually the 12 apostles because they were followers of the Okay, so part of your homework is to find the passage in Scripture that says that's what an apostle is. <laughs> cool. Okay. <laughs> That's what we were, we're all taught that, so let's, we won't do it now, but find that, that where it says, uh, here's what an apostle is. It's somebody who's seen Christ and had an experience with Christ and so forth. Does anybody know what the actual word means? Just, just like if you took whatever the Greek word is behind it, if you took that word and found out what that meant. The word apostle sounds somewhat like a different word we have. Apostle sounds almost like epistle. It's just a different beginning. Apostle, epistle. Epistle is a letter sent. An apostle is a person sent, like an ambassador, like a person who's got authority, not just a preacher, but it's somebody who has been sent by our Lord to carry a message with some authority behind it, to say, I'm here, I'm an apostle. He's seen Christ. He's talked to Christ, Christ talked to him, and sent him, here's what you need to do, and he sent him out, an emissary. So Paul is, Paul is an apostle, sent out. Um, of Jesus Christ, he's sent out by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, and um, Paul said he was called. He was called. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to take some time now and review for us the experience that Paul had. What's the gist of Paul's call, his conversion, his change of heart? What, 
give me the gist and then we'll look at uh, the actual stuff up. What happened to him? What was he doing? He, to Damascus. he, was, he was on his way to Damascus. To okay. Get some Christians. To do what? Get Christians and put them in jail. To put Christians in jail. That was what he was doing. And then all of a sudden, a light came. And what else happened? He heard a voice. He heard a voice. Did everybody else hear the voice? No. Well, we're going to be reading it in a minute. So he, was there light, did you say? Yes. There was some light. What else happened? He fell on the ground. He fell on the ground. He was blinded. He was ordered to get up and go. Um, sent forth by Christ. Sent forth by Christ. Okay. Um, so let's look up some of these passages here. Let's turn to start with Acts 9. So, you know, what we try to do oftentimes in the Christian life is we try to, we try to in our devotional life, in our meditation, we, we try to have a quick devotional, chalk it, chalk, chalk it off and say we've ca- accomplished our devotional for today. If you're going to study, and that's, that's fine. Sometimes we need, we need just a 15-minute time with the Lord and just some quiet. And, but if you're going to study, then all of a sudden we get to like the third word and we're on apostle and called. These different verses said called, so we did a little comparison of the different beginnings of some of the epistles, and we find the word called, so then we say, well, now how did that all happen again? And if you're a new Christian, you might not know those what you just pieced together for me, and so you start studying, and you go, okay, where is that? So then they start digging, where is, where is the call, how did that happen, right? So, Acts 9, um, beginning at verse 5. Well, verse 3, Acts 9, 3, suddenly a light shone around them from heaven. Then he, Paul, fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Can you imagine what that was like? I mean, he was convinced he was right. He, he said he was more, more righteous than virtually anybody. He kept all the laws. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I mean, he was right down the line Judaism. And all of a sudden, he's, somebody says to him from the heaven, why are you persecuting me? Why are you picking on me? And so what does Paul say? He said, who are you, Lord? So he knew, I think he knew who was talking to him. Verse 5, he says, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus. Can you imagine the shock? Because Jesus was dead as far as Paul was concerned. Um, I looked up, another question was, in my mind was, how old was Paul when all this happened? And they don't really know, but the best guesses are he was five, six, seven years younger than Jesus was, um, based on some of the clues. There's nothing very definite, but when, at one point he was a young man. It says in scripture he was a young man. Was that when uh, Stephen was stoned? And in, in Hebrew, when you say a young man, that implies a certain age span. So they kind of picture what would be the oldest in that age span. How would that fit? Um, so he says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads, the pricks, the prods. He's kicking against it, is what he's doing. And people do that today. They're kicking against it. They know God, everybody knows God's there, and they kick against it. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? That was a good question. Okay, I can see my life is changing. Now what, do, what, am I, what should I be doing, right? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless. And what was the, what's the next line say? They were speechless. Hearing a, voice, but seeing no one. Hearing a voice, but seeing no one. So they did hear something. Verse 8, then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, this is interesting. I noticed, I, this is the first time I've noticed this when I was reading it earlier today. When he, he arose, his eyes were opened, and he saw no one. So it wasn't like, sometimes in the Bible when they say their eyes were opened, that means they can see. 
But in this case, I think his eyes were closed. And when he opened them, he still couldn't see. That's what I think is going on here. He was blind. Um, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight and neither ate or drank. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. Now right now, Ananias is not with Paul, right? So Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias said, Lord, I have heard that about many things about this man, how much harm he has done to the saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. So was Ananias eager to go visit Paul? No. Um, probably for a couple of reasons. He might be afraid. And in the second thing, he might not really want him healed. If he was kind of blind, it would be kind of fun to leave him that way since he's being a persecutor of everybody. But the Lord said to him, go for he, look at this now, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. How would you like that kind of revelation? I'm Jesus. Here's what I would like to do. Here's the list of things you're going to suffer. Um, but that's what he did for Paul. Um, Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, that's interesting, isn't it? He believed God. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he rose and was baptized. And then he received food and was strengthened and so forth. All right, so that's that um, account by Luke as to what happened. Now let's go over to Acts chapter 22. Here's Paul's own account. Acts 22, 12 to 15. Paul is addressing the Jerusalem mob. So he's standing up, there's thousands of people around him, and they just really want to kind of stretch him into two pieces because they're just angry with him. And so he's up there giving his testimony. And verse 11, he said, uh, Acts 22, he's telling about being blinded. And since I could not see for the glory of the light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came to Damascus. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me. And he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at the same hour, I looked up at him. And then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be the wit his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. So that's Paul's testimony of what happened. Um, he says, The God of your fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one. So he did see Jesus, didn't he? He saw him, and that's Paul's, that's Paul's own testimony. And then you turn to another couple chapters over to chapter 26. You have Paul's testimony to the king of Agrippa, I think it was. Acts 26. Verse 11 Acts 26, 11, he says, And I punished them, he was talking about the church, I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme and being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. So Paul was all over the place chasing the Christians down. While thus occupied, I, while I was busy with that job, he said, um, I, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, so he had the papers in his hand, right? What do you call it? And nowadays, what they, if they come to arrest you nowadays, what do we call that? An arrest warrant. An arrest warrant. They had the, he had the warrant in his hand. He had some official from the Jewish priests, and he said, I'm here to take you into custody. 
And uh, that was not a good thing for those people. At midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, that's the first I knew now that they all fell to the ground, they all, I heard the voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, that's the first I knew it was Hebrew, I don't think that was mentioned in the other passages, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people, as well as from the Gentiles, to whom I now send you, to open their eyes, in order to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So that was Paul's commission, right? According to him, and as he talked to King Agrippa. So that's how he became called to be an apostle. That's what he wrote in those letters. One more place that's important to look at is in Galatians. He trying to prove to the Galatian people. So let's turn there, Galatians chapter one. Galatians chapter 1, starting in verse 11. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. So he's telling them, he said, this is not my made-up stuff. He said, it's not according to man, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what's he saying about the message he's preaching? It was given directly to him by Jesus. Exactly. It was given directly from Jesus. Verse 13, For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the tradition of my fathers. So he was a really, he was gung-ho, as they say, for, his, for the Jewish thing. Now we have a really long sentence from verse 15 through verse 17. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood nor did I go to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Now, one of the things, I don't know if you remember high school English, but here's, here's one of the things I'm convinced of, and we, sometimes people don't like to go here. But God is a God of words, right? He speaks. In order to hear from God, you have to know the language that God is speaking to you in. So our, the, the Holy, Holy Bible, the scriptures, have been translated into English for us. And so in order to hear from God in an English Bible, what do we have to know how to do? First of all, you have to know how to read. People who don't read don't hear from God unless... If you can't read, how else can you hear from God? If, it, if, if by listening, if somebody reads it to you or preaches to you, right? Now, when you have language and you're reading it in your scriptures, you have to understand how the language works, how it's built. So one of the things on this Bible study guide thing I have here is I have one short section that says grammar on the back page. It says grammar. When sentences are particularly long, be sure you know what the main subject and verb are. Be sure you know things like what the antecedent is and things like that. So you have to go way back to English. How many of you had to diagram sentences in English? I tried. Some people found it very difficult, right? But here you have a very long sentence. So let's pretend we're in English. We won't, we won't diagram it. We've got five minutes to do it. <coughs> 
Look at verses 15 to 17. Can you figure out what the subject of the sentence is? If you're in an English class, there's lots of nouns here. Be, be prepared to be wrong. What's the subject? Subject is usually a noun. God. It's not God. And the main verb is not reveal. Some. If, what? It. No, the, the, the subject is I in verse 16, and the verb is confer, and there is, there's a not in front of it. I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. That's, that's the main sentence. I did not confer with flesh and blood, and I also I did not go up to Jerusalem, but I went to Arabia. That's the main that's the main sentence. Okay? Why isn't God at the beginning, but when it pleased God, or it? Because there's a when in front of it. And that's some kind of clause, which the name I can't remember. But that's not the subject of the sentence. That's like when it happened. If you say, when, when, I, go to, when I go to work, my car always starts immediately. What's the subject? I, when I go to work? No, it's car. When, when does the car start immediately? When I go to work. That's kind of a modifier of it. Now, you didn't want to get into English, but what did we just say? God speaks in language. So if we're going to understand what God is saying, we have to understand how the language works. Well, I don't want to learn all that. I don't want to go through all that work. Well, then you can't hear from God out of this sentence. That, that's the way, that's what it amounts to. Pardon? You can ask God to show you. <laughs> so without without the English stuff. <laughs> you did what? Ask God to show you without the English. Yeah, don't talk to me, just show me somehow. Yeah. Yeah. I just feel like it means this. I just feel no. So here's 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 what's going on here. He's telling you I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. Well, what, what's the time frame? When is this happening, this part? I did not confer with flesh and blood, but I went, to, I went to these people, and I went to Arabia. When is that in his life? Right. The time frame here is when he was saved. That's when I did not confer with flesh and blood, but I, nor did I go to Jerusalem, but I went to Arabia, and then I came back to Damascus. That's what he's talking about. So what's the descriptors of that moment? The descriptors of that moment are when it pleased God, verse 15, when it pleased God, comma, now you have another thing that's kind of a parenthesis here, when it pleased God to reveal his son in me. When it pleased God to reveal his son in me, that's when all of this started. So Paul's going about his thing, and he says, God is the one who separated me from my mother's womb. Now, how many years ago was that? He's like, he's 30 years old now or something like that. So 30 years ago in his mother's womb, God separated him for this ministry. But it didn't please God to reveal Christ to him until 30 years later, he's on the way to destroy some churches and God goes, okay. You see, the, see what's happening here? This is an amazing testimony. God already had the plan for Paul way back there, but he didn't reveal it to him when he was seven. He didn't save him when he was seven. He saved him when he was 30 or 35 or something like that. But he's a, God said, you're a chosen vessel for me. I've called you to minister. I've called you to do all these things, to take my name to the nations and all of that. And God did it when he wanted to do it. And Paul responded, did he not? He accepted Christ. He could have said, I'm not going there. Is this, I'm going back to killing people. But he didn't want to do that. When you have a thing like that, you kind of follow it, don't you? When, you, when you're struck with light and you say, I better get going, you kind of think you better get going. Tom? When you back up and he said that it was hard to kick against the pricks, what, what's he talking about? The, the, the goads that God's using him to get him where he wants him to be. God's working on him. 
he didn't know it, Paul didn't know it, but he's, God, God directs our paths even before we're saved. You came, you came to know Christ because somebody witnessed to you. How did you get in that position where that person could witness to you? God's directing, God's moving. Tom, Tom was working at GM, right? I got the story right. You, you were witnessed to over here by these people. Ted was over here in this other department, if I understand the story right. And unbeknownst to you, God's working. You got ticked off with these people that were, were witnessing to you. And so you said, I'm going to transfer over to this other department. But Tom didn't know that God had put Ted over there. And so all these events are being orchestrated. And God's always doing that. God's doing a lot of things we don't even, don't, don't even realize he's doing. Yeah, you can't really resist what God's doing. God is at work, and he's, he's poking and not prodding and, and getting you to do things. You might not know it's God doing it, but you get fed up with some situation, so you sell your house and you move somewhere else, and, and God's at work in all of that, accomplishing what he wants to do. And it's an amazing thing when you think about it. So we better close in prayer. Um, I encourage you to use this, do some studying this week. Just not all week, but take, take an hour sometime this next week. Take Colossians 1, 1 through 8 and kind of think through it and jot some notes down with some questions. Bring some questions next time. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. We pray that you would help us to, um, when we see what, how you worked with in Paul's life and how you got him where you wanted him and how he was such a force. He wrote so much of our New Testament. And um, it's an amazing thing. And it helps us to have confidence in the work that you're doing in our lives putting us where you want us, helping us to have the gifts that you want us to have to be able to use for your glory. So we're grateful for that. Help us to be encouraged and thankful for your work in us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.